Hello and welcome to Big Picture Monday. My name is Callie Black here with all the context you need to totally rock this week's Come Follow Me readings this week. We are back in the book of John. We are studying John chapters two through four. So we've got three chapters in the lovely book of John. It's been a few weeks since we were first in John one. Um, and remember I've mentioned John is kind of separate than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're switching back and forth. They're telling the same stories, but with different details, right? Because they, Matthew and Luke were based off of the accounts that Mark wrote, which Peter likely told him what to write. Um, and then we've got John over here doing his own thing. So it's just very different, which is exciting, but also sometimes when we're like, wait, how does this all fit together? With John, it doesn't. It doesn't always really fit together, and you'll see that, um, but I still love being able to learn from his words. Um, as a little bit of context, in John chapter 1, we had last read about Jesus being baptized. He had called his apostles, so this is all sound unfamiliar, and then at the end of John 1 is where we had that interaction with Nathaniel, and Nathaniel was not sure that this person was the promised Messiah, and Jesus said that he saw Nathaniel earlier under a fig tree. And that was what Nathaniel needed in order to profess that Jesus was actually the Messiah and to choose to follow him. So that's where we kind of left off in the book of John. There's a few other things we need to make a little bit more clear before we start reading. The first is last week we read that Jesus, after coming out of the wilderness and being tempted, he learned that John the Baptist had been put into prison by Herod Antipas. But in John chapter 3 this week, we're going to read a bunch of teachings from John the Baptist. So John is not in prison yet when we're now in um, the book of John. So rewind that part of your memory. John the Baptist is not in prison. And when you read John, when you, let me be clear on this, when you read the name John within the book of John, it is referring to John the Baptist, not John the Apostle who's actually writing the account. Um he does not refer to himself by name. Instead, he refers to John the Baptist as John, okay? So just to kind of clear that up before we go into it. Um, I mentioned when we first started the book of John a few weeks ago that John really focuses on, John the author, the apostle, uh, really focuses on the main miracles that Jesus performs. And in fact, John focuses on seven miracles. You may be familiar with this. Of course, Jesus performed way more than seven miracles, and John knew this as well, but he really wants to focus on seven miracles, and he actually literally numbers them as we're going throughout his account. <laughs> You'll see he's labeling the seven miracles. And so since we know John is very familiar with Jesus and that John knew about many more miracles, I think it's interesting to ponder on why these seven miracles are the ones that he's pointing out. This week, we get to read about the first two. We get to read the first miracle, which is when Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding feast. That's at John chapter 2. And then at the end of John chapter 4, we'll get the second miracle, which is when Jesus heals a nobleman's son. So those are the two um, main miracles that John is focusing on. But there's tons more stuff that's happening. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the stuff happening in these chapters is not mentioned anywhere in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. So like, this is it this week. There's no like, oh, we'll probably hit this story again later. I'll dive into it more. No, no, no. This is it. So many good little stories and teachings and prophecies. So uh, can you tell I love John? <laughs> it's great. Um, so much good stuff. Dive into everything in these three chapters this week because man, is it powerful. Okay, one last piece of context. If you were here with me last year for the Old Testament, you'll be like, Psh, I can totally do this, no problem. Um, I want to tell you in 30 seconds about Samaria because this week we are learning about Jesus visiting a woman at the well. And this woman at the well was a Samaritan, and she was in the land of Samaria. Now, why was Samaria so hated? A lot of us are familiar with the later parable that Jesus tells about the good Samaritan, right? And a lot of people ignored him. But a lot of us forget that the woman at the well was a Samaritan as well. So here in 30 seconds, I'm going to tell you why Samaria was so unique and disliked by all the other Israelites. So if you think back in Old Testament times, when Israel was united under the reign of like King David and King Solomon, those were their glory days, right? Like 
so awesome. Everyone's all united. And then things fell apart. They split into the two kingdoms. They had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, the southern kingdom of Judah had the capital city of Jerusalem, which meant they also had the temple, right? They had the temple, Judah, Jerusalem. Awesome. The northern kingdom of Israel had the capital city of Samaria. That was the name of their capital city, Samaria. Now, these kingdoms increasingly grew animosity towards each other to the point where they would not even go into each other's territory, which meant we now have a group of people up here in northern Israel who are not attending the temple anymore because the temple is in Jerusalem. So already we're starting to see this shift in priorities, right? Putting like political and social issues over worshiping in the temple, right? And so we have this group starting to kind of distort their ways and they are the first group that's conquered. The Assyrians come in and conquer them. Remember, they're taken away. This is the scattering of Israel because 10 of the tribes were up in Northern Israel. They are scattered. Um, the Assyrians take them away. But in the capital city of Samaria, the Assyrians left a few people and they only left the people who were super poor and super uneducated for a couple reasons. First of all, they wanted the rich people and they wanted the smart people with them, so they took them away into their lands. But also, they didn't want the Samaritans rebelling against their new rule under Assyrian leadership. And so they knew the smart the the people who are uneducated, the people who are poor are less likely to get together and actually start a revolt. So, we have this kind of weird mixture of people who are left, and then we have Assyrians who are staying there. And then the Assyrians conquer more people and kind of lots of other cultures start coming to Samaria. It basically becomes this melting pot of a lot of different cultures. But here's the weird part. It's like they, the, the Israelites who were still in Samaria still knew that there was a Messiah coming and they still knew correct things about the gospel but they weren't quite doing everything as they should. They lost their priesthood authority. They didn't have any like leading North Star with them. Like they were just kind of doing their own thing, but they also did know some of the right stuff. And so they thought they were on par with the other people in Judah and Jerusalem. They were like, yeah, yeah, we're all the same. And the people in Judah and Jerusalem were like, you guys are way off course. Like you're not even close to being where you should be when it comes to our spiritual customs and our spiritual worship and the correct scriptures and everything like that. So. Fast forward, just tons of animosity between Judah and Jerusalem and the Samaritans and Samaria. Now we come to Jesus's time. There is like, it's hard to even say animosity because they just straight up hated each other. They would not even interact with each other. It was just a stated fact. They would not interact with each other. The Samaritans were still largely poor and uneducated and they didn't have everything right when it came to religion. And so the Jews were not going to associate that with them. So keep that in mind when we get to the story of the woman at the well. Um, that is some context for Christ stopping in Samaria. That is like mind blowing. Okay, let's jump into what we're getting specifically in these three chapters this week. Um, let's start with chapter two. Chapter two, we start with the first miracle, which is where Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding feast. And this is kind of the start of his ministry in the book of, like according to the book of John. Jesus then leaves this wedding feast and is now um, beginning his ministry. He then goes to the temple in Jerusalem and he cleanses the temple. He gets rid of money changers and people who were using the temple grounds for their own gain, which you may think, wait, didn't Jesus do this like at the end of his life, like during Holy Week, right before he's crucified. Um, the interesting thing is, is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem shortly, like literally just a few days before he was crucified. But John tells us way at the beginning of Jesus's life. And so we actually believe that Jesus did this twice. Jesus cleansed the temple twice. And we get one account of it in John, and we get a second account of it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke way at the end of Jesus's life. So 
Jesus is there, he's at the temple. He then teaches them using um, the temple as a metaphor for his body. He teaches them that he will be crucified and resurrected, but he's using language like, you know, the temple being thrown down and then being built up three days later. And the people are very, very confused as to what this is meaning um, as Jesus is teaching this. Um, and he, he performs more miracles there at that point. Okay, now let's go to chapter three. Chapter three of John, we get to learn about a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is fantastic. He was a Pharisee. So if you remember, we've learned about Pharisees, just very strict interpretation of, of the law of Moses and the other written rules that have been added. But he also was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the rule, the governing body um, in Jerusalem the, uh, of the Jews. And so Nicodemus was very rich and very powerful. <laughs> we can tell from those, those couple things there. He likely had a lot of resources and a lot of power available to him. And um, Jesus and Nicodemus have a really interesting conversation. And Jesus is teaching Nicodemus that we must be born again. We must be born of water and of the spirit. And Nicodemus is very confused. Very, he keeps asking Jesus these questions like, I'm an old man, how could I be babbed? How could I be born again? That doesn't make sense. And so he and Jesus are having this conversation and we actually, we don't get a resolution for it. As you read John three, you might be like, wait, what happened? What's, what's the end of this story? There's no end of the story in John three. Um, if you want a spoiler alert though, Later on in John chapter 7, we'll study that in a few months, actually. <laughs> it's going to be a long time until we get there. Um, we learn that um, Nicodemus stands up for Jesus. And then even when Jesus is crucified, Nicodemus is one of the two men with spices who goes to the tomb to prepare Jesus's body as well. So um, even though we don't get an actual resolution here, things turn out pretty well for Nicodemus's personal relationship with Jesus, which I think is pretty cool. Um, in the rest of chapter three, um, we then turn to John the Baptist. So you'll see a bunch about John preaching and he's teaching his people, I am not the Messiah. I am here to prepare the way for the Messiah. And in this chapter in John, we really get this sense that people, a lot of John's followers were very confused. Um, in fact, some of them seem to be jealous that Jesus had more followers than John the Baptist. And so they're like, uh, John, what are you doing about this? And John is like, listen, this is my purpose is to pre prepare the way for Jesus and to point people towards Jesus. And so we get this beautiful testimony from John the Baptist for the rest of chapter three. Okay, and then we get to go to chapter four. This is it. Jesus is traveling and he decides that he needs to go through Samaria, which is absolutely not true. A lot of the Jews went around Samaria, um, but Jesus decided he needed to go to Samaria and there he meets a woman at the well. And they have this beautiful conversation. She's trying to get water for him and he starts to say that um, he's living water and anyone who drinks of him shall never thirst again. And clearly this woman is confused at first, but eventually Jesus is able to perceive some things about her personal life. And she says she knows that a, a Messiah will come. These Samaritans did know about basic religious things. And she says, I know a Messiah will come. And Jesus declares his divinity to her and tells her that he is the Messiah. Now she is so excited. She goes and tells everyone about this interaction. And Jesus then teaches people. And some of the Samaritans are converted by hearing what other people are telling them. Some are converted by hearing Jesus himself. And a whole bunch of people are converted unto Jesus in Samaria, which I love. Um, at the end of chapter four, then Jesus moves on. And when he gets back to Galilee, he sees a nobleman. He meets with a nobleman and he tells the nobleman that his son is healed. This is the second miracle when the nobleman goes back home and he sees that his son has been healed. He knows that it was truly a miracle and from the Messiah. Okay. That's it. So many great stories. I'm excited to dive into them this week. I think um, my personal focus question for this week comes from very famous scriptures this week. John 3, 17, super famous one, talks about how Jesus is not come to the world to condemn the world. And boy, does my mind like to convince me sometimes that Jesus is ready to tell me all the things that I'm doing wrong, <laughs> because I'm really good at telling myself that. Um, but I want to focus on that scripture and learn what is Jesus here to do? He's not sent to condemn the world. He's not here to condemn me. 
what is he going to do? And how can I lean into that um, and lean towards my Savior to help me with that? Okay, have a great week this week studying the words of John and happy studying.